Happy Sabbath! How are you all? I hope you all enjoy your week. Tonight, I pray to the Lord that each of us will continue to bless by Him with protection and with healing and with the indwelling Holy Spirit to enlighten us. And we're going to continue to study a book called Christ's Object Lesson, and the author is Ellen G. White. And tonight, the chapter is focused on Luke chapter 16, 19 to 31. Let me read it to you. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angel carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades. And where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from here to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will, also, they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. I have a few points from this parable. Number one. Does this parable denote there is life after death? You know, for many centuries, even now, many believe the conversation between the rich man, Lazarus, and Abraham was an afterlife experience. They think the poor man was in Abraham's bosom, meaning that he went to heaven after he died. And on the other hand, the rich man, after his death, he was in hell being tormented by fire. But actually, in the Bible, Abraham's bosom is the region in Sheol or Hades. Today's word, the grave. And here in the, in the, in the parable, denotes the grave for the righteous. Remember in the Old Testament, which was the only scripture in Jesus' days, right? often express the death of those who obey God as gather to their fathers. And the father was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, what it meant when they say in regard to the disease that he was in Abraham's bosom was they were among the righteous, and therefore they were buried where their righteous fathers were buried. And on the other hand, the rich men, was an example of those who, again, I will use Old Testament scripture, being cut off, meaning he has been cut off from his righteous ancestors and not able to bury with them. Also accompany the indication that he has been cut off from the hope of eternal life with God. By the time of Jesus, because of the influence of several centuries of Greeks ruling and then the Romans, and under their attractive culture, these symbols 
were being understood literally, more or less literally, especially in the people's folk culture. But we know in scripture, Jesus referred to the dead as what? As asleep, meaning that the dead have the potential of returning to life, but it is at after the resurrection, after Jesus' second coming. We observed when Jesus tells parables, he often used things that the people were familiar with. And in this parable, Jesus used their folk belief to demonstrate a deeper truth. Well, let me demonstrate to you that the Bible does not teach life after death. Okay, let's go to Psalms chapter 6, verse 5. This is what King David said. For in death, there is no remembrance of you, he says to God. And then he asks, in Sheol, who can give you praise? And then another place in Psalm chapter 115 and verse 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any that go down into silence. And in another book, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and the jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. So that clarifies it, isn't it? There are many other places in the Bible that demonstrate that there is no life after death until after the resurrection. Another point. Thus, this parable denotes all rich men are not interested in salvation from Christ and all poor men will get to heaven. No, not all rich men are indifferent towards salvation and not all rich men are insensitive to the poor. Here the parable is telling us that there are two classes of people, the ones who are in good positions to lend help, but did not. And the second class are those who are needy and in need of help. You notice the rich man in this parable was not a Gentile. He knew Father Abraham, and therefore he knew Moses and Moses' laws. He was familiar with what Moses said about loving God and loving their neighbors. However, he, the rich man, though he allowed Lazarus, the poor homeless man with sores, to sit at his gate day in and day out, but he didn't lend a hand to care for him. He was probably too busy and too occupied with his worldly life. You know, in those days, there was no hospital or homeless shelter like today to care for people like Lazarus. And the responsibility was left for those who has resources and ability to help. The rich man was condemned in this parable, not because he was rich or because he was cruel to this poor man, but because he didn't help him with his God given resource. And like I mentioned, if he was Abraham's child, he would know Moses' laws. And Moses' law said, each man is obligated to uplift humanity. And he is to give in proportion to how much he himself has. Let me read to you Deuteronomy 7, verse 12 to 15. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. And that is why I give you this command today. 
So according to this verse, the master is to provide generously for the freed slave, giving to him out from the blessing that he himself, the master, has received from God. Another verse in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28 to 29. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns so that the Levites who have no allotment or inheritance of their own and the foreigners, the fatherless and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So the Hebrews had to pay three tithes the first one is for the priests and the Levites. Second one is for their annual feasts. And the third one is for the Levites again and the poor. The third one is only once every three years. And the tithe they gave, which is 10% of their grains, is stored in the town. So that it is a community project to help the foreigners and the poor besides the Levites. So this rich man in the parable knew and understood the law. And the following quote is from the author about why the rich man was so preoccupied and forgetting his responsibility. She said, forgetful of his accountability to God, he devoted all his power to pleasure. Everything with which he was surrounded, his round of amusement, the praise and flattery of his friends, minister to his selfish enjoyment. So engrossed was he in the society of his friends that he lost all sense of his responsibility to cooperate with God in his ministry of mercy. Furthermore, the author also pointed out something else. She said God considered greed and self-centeredness as idolatry because their eyes are self-focused and not focused on God or anyone else. You know, there's no sin in being rich if riches are not acquired by injustice. A rich man is not condemned for having riches, but he is condemned if the wealth that is entrusted to him is spent in selfishness. And during the rich man's lifetime, he had a lot of good things, but he forgot that he has responsibility to God, not only about his own salvation, but also about serving God by lending hands to the needy and also to save the lost souls. The parable also tells us that money or temporal things cannot be carried into the next life. It is not needed there. On earth, one is respected and valued by how much he possessed. But in heaven, no man is valued because of his earthly possessions. On the other hand, the good deeds done in winning souls to Christ are carried to the heavenly courts and will be rewarded. But those who selfishly spend God's gift on themselves, leaving the needy fellow man without help and doing nothing to advance God's work in this world, have dishonored their maker. And the author described those who have mismanaged God's gift and not doing their responsibility. She said a misuse of these gifts will place him below the poorest and most afflicted man who loves God and trusts in him. Another point. In this parable, who does the poor man represent? The poor man, Lazarus, represents those who endure trials and suffering, persevere through hardship, and never give up his eternal hope in Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he was witnessing for Christ. He persevered through the test of faith. 
and he didn't curse God for his misfortune. So when he died, he's been carried by the angel to Abraham's bosom, meaning when the trumpet sound announcing Christ's second coming, he among all the righteous who are in the grave will hear Christ's voice and come forth and they will be comforted as they receive their reward in heaven because they have been faithful and the faith in God was real and they had demonstrated during their lifetime. Another point. In the parable, there was a gulf or a chasm between the rich man and Lazarus. What does that mean? You know, in the days of Jesus, the Jews were very proud of the heritage because they were the children or seeds of Abraham, the chosen one, the favored people of God. But sadly, they were the seeds of Abraham in name only. They did not truly worship or serve God. In the Bible, we read that they mistreated foreigners and the poor. They were just like the rich man in this parable. They lived a selfish life and they didn't lend their hands to relieve those who were suffering, both physically or spiritually. And this group of people, if we can use today's term, they are Christians in name only. They lack compassion to the suffering fellow man. And this group of believers are in contrast to those whom God consider to be true children of Abraham, who do the works of Abraham. And although they may be poor in worldly possession, but they are in harmony with Abraham by obeying the commands of God. So they are recognized by God to be his favored people. So there is a character gap or character chasm between the true children of Abraham and those who are in name only. But is there any remedy for people who are like the rich man? Yes, according to the author, in this life, if one allow the Holy Spirit to mold his or her mind and heart so that he or she can be transformed from self-centeredness to becoming caring, God-centered individuals. In that way, he or she is closing his or her character chasm through faith in Christ Jesus. Another point. Is there a limit to God's grace? According to the parable, while we are alive, God's grace is available for us. But the choice is ours to choose whether we want to use our allotted time on earth to pursue things of eternal value or to pursue selfish aims. This life is the only time given to us to prepare for our eternal life. And it is impossible for us to secure salvation of our soul after we die. Another point. Some people said they'll believe if God sends them signs or miracles. In this parable, it tells us that if the scripture with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, doesn't convict us, nothing will. You see, the rich man has spent his life doing things to please himself, and it was too late by the time he realized it. He realized his foolish mistakes, and he thought of his brothers who were just like him, and who would keep on living the self-centered life. So he made a request to Abraham. He asked, he said, then I beg you, Father, Send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, 
But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. The rich man requested to send additional evidence to his brothers beside the scripture which had already been given so they would make the same mistake like the rich man. But he was told frankly that even additional evidence were to be given to his brother, they wouldn't change. The author said his request is actually an indirect blame to God that if God had given him more evidence and warning, he wouldn't be suffering or tormenting in hell. And Abraham answered that his brothers had been given lights. But if they choose not to see it and not to hear it, even more signs and evidence wouldn't help them to change. In Luke 16, 31, this is what Abraham answered. He said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. These words were proved true in the history of the Jewish nation. Christ's last and crowning miracle was the raising of Lazarus of Bethany. Do you remember that? And after last, this was, this was after Lazarus had been dead for four days. The Jews were given this wonderful evidence of the Savior's divinity. But they rejected it. Lazarus rose from the dead and testified the power of Jesus Christ and that he is the Savior. But then what? They hardened their hearts against all evidence and even what? Sought to take Jesus' life. And you could read that in John chapter 12, 9 to 11. But those who reject the scripture they will also harden their hearts and reject all lights to them. He also said, if man fails to do that which a little light shows to be his duty, greater light will only reveal unfaithfulness. Just like what the Bible said in Luke 16, 10. If that is he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Now I'm going to read Mark chapter 8 verse 36 to 37. And this will sum up the parable. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This parable is also speaking to us. Although we are believers, we can be like the rich man if we are chasing after the temporal things of this world and neglect to love God and love man. According to the author, now is the time to seek the Lord and now is the time to accept his grace and to experience his sacred influence, to allow his character to mold our character. Once our life is over, there's no more opportunity. So let none of us be Christians in name only. Instead, we should live in his grace, abide in him, and serve him until he comes. And then we shall hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew 25, 21. Happy Sabbath. <music>